very much an honor to have our Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences with us to kick off the day. Uh, Bob Stacy has been so active, not only as our Dean of the UW's College of Arts and Sciences, but also as a professor of history here. His other leadership positions near the university have included many. Uh, Division uh, Dean of the Arts and Humanities, Divisional Dean of Social Sciences, Chair of the Department of History, Chair of the Jewish Studies Program at Jackson School of International Studies. He's a Guggenheim and ACLS Fellowship recipient, distinguished teaching awards from both the UW and Yale, and get these degrees, a PhD from Yale, a BA from Williams, a BA MA from Oxford. So in other words, a real slacker with us. <laughs> <laughs> we are so honored to have our Dean of Arts and Science. Big hand, Bob Stacey. Usually I don't have any trouble hitting the back of the room. Uh, if I do, start waving. Uh, when I met the new rabbi at Hillel uh, a year or two ago, and was he was running down the CV that Mike just ran down for you, his comment was, so, you can't keep a job. <laughs> That's about right. My topic this morning is scholarly interests and career opportunities. So let me start with the good news. The good news is that your student's scholarly interests, that is to say, the subjects that he or she is passionate about, uh, his, their scholarly interests and their career opportunities are not incompatible. It's quite the opposite. Employers want to hire people who are passionately interested in what they do. By contrast, for the most part, the specific subject in which a student majors is way down the list of what employers care about. It's as far down the list as the student's GPA. <clears throat> employers, frankly, don't much care about either one. Now, there's a few exceptions to this, of course. If a business wants to hire an accountant, chances are they're going to hire an accounting major. If a business needs a structural engineer, chances are they'll hire a structural engineering major. But for the vast majority of our students, the generalization holds. In finding a job after graduation, it really doesn't matter very much what your student majors in or how high his or her grades are. This is even true in the high-tech sector. Take Google, for example which to our students is certainly one of the hottest and most desirable companies for which to work. Google has five criteria for every job they hire, including computer code writers. In descending order of importance, starting with the most important, those five criteria are these. First, learning ability. The ability to pull disparate pieces of information together on the fly and make something new out of it. Second, leadership. And leadership something means something very specific to Google. It asks, do you make the team better? Do you step up when the team needs you to step up? And do you step back when the team needs you to step back? Third, ownership. Do you have a sense of responsibility and personal accountability for the team's success in solving a problem? Fourth, intellectual humility. Are you prepared to change your mind when new information comes to you? Usually, people learn intellectual humility from their failures. Google believes hugely in failure. So should we, and so should our students. Finally, fifth, last, expertise, content knowledge. If Google is hiring a coder, does the candidate know how to write code? Fair question. Notice, however, that this comes last in the list. And coding alone is not going to get you a job at Google. And for half the jobs at Google, it doesn't even matter. So here's an example of a 2013 UW graduate, a major in history and American ethnic studies, who was hired at Google. 
When asked about the search process by which she was hired, she wrote, they, Google, were most concerned that I could write and speak well, critically think and assess problems from a multitude of vantage points, and analyze trends and data. But she also highlighted how a class in, get this, pre-Columbian Latin American history got her her job at Google. She explained, Google has something called the analytic value chain, which is essentially the steps they take in analyzing employee data and drawing conclusions about the trends that data reveals. I was able to compare this value chain to how I approached historical work. I think I talked specifically about how I might go about extracting information from an Aztec codex. They hired her on the spot. As she concluded, the skills I learned from the UW History Department and faculty, from close reading a document to compiling a successful research project, have a very practical application outside the academy. So how does a student become this kind of a job applicant? One great way to get this kind of preparation is through the breadth and depth of an undergraduate education in the College of Arts and Sciences. Now, it may surprise you to hear me talk about an arts and sciences education, or if you wish, a liberal arts education. The two terms are synonymous. It may surprise you to hear me talk about a liberal arts education as career preparation, because we're being inundated recently with a different message, a message that the liberal arts are useless, and that only by studying science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the so-called STEM disciplines, uh, do today's students stand any reasonable chance of finding a job when they graduate. Now, I have no wish to denigrate STEM subjects. After all, as we are fond of remarking, the College of Arts and Sciences is the S and M in STEM. <laughs> we are the science and the mathematics. But I do want to argue strongly that STEM subjects are not the only subjects worth studying, nor are they the only or possibly even the best routes to a rewarding career. Indeed, I'll go further. I think in most cases it's a mistake for undergraduates to limit their education to courses and subjects that are narrowly tailored to preparing them for a single, very specific entry-level job. So let me explain why I think this is true. Since 1945, a broad education in the liberal arts, including the sciences, has proved to be the very best career preparation and the very best predictor of long-term career success of any American undergraduate degree program. For 70 years, Arts and sciences graduates have, on average, outstripped business and engineering graduates in lifetime earnings and in career satisfaction. To be sure, many of these students went on to earn professional degrees in law or business or medicine. I'm not suggesting that in every case their undergraduate degree alone was sufficient to guarantee career satisfaction or personal uh, professional success. But the facts still stand. Liberal arts graduates are disproportionately successful in almost every field they enter. When the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies were polled some years ago, the largest single number of them proved to have been history majors as undergraduates. <coughs> when Forbes magazine listed the 10 most powerful CEOs in America, under the age of 40, seven of the 10 were liberal arts majors. And in 2012, when the top 1% of American wage earners were studied, those are people making 380,000 a year and up. So when this 1% was studied and they were asked what they had majored in as undergraduates, once again, the liberal arts came out on top. Economics majors led the way, 
followed by political science, art history, President Obama, take note, and religious studies. Finance, pharmacy, and accounting were the other three in the top seven. Altogether, those seven made up one-third of the majors. Now, admittedly, this is history. And as Henry, the, uh, Henry Ford famously remarked, history is bunk. <laughs> so perhaps in 21st century America, a liberal arts education will not have the same extraordinary impact on personal satisfaction, career success, and social mobility that it has had during the 20th century. That's possible. I wouldn't bet on it. If current predictions hold true, most of our students graduating today from UW will hold 10 different jobs by the time they retire. Many of the jobs they will hold in the course of their careers don't even exist at the moment because they haven't been invented. <clears throat> Nobody was training web developers 20 years ago. What will determine the long-term success of our students then is not so much their first job. Rather, it will be their capacity to adapt to a rapidly and con constantly changing economic and social landscape. <clears throat> to learn new skills, to analyze and evaluate information in new ways, and to communicate effectively in a diverse and dynamic society. We know, moreover, that these are precisely the skills that employers are looking for. Every survey that's done, including several in the last year, says the same thing. Why then should the future for liberal arts graduates be different from what it has been in the past? Now let me be clear. I'm not arguing that fewer students should study natural sciences and mathematics. <clears throat> Science and math have been part of a liberal arts education for 2,500 years. I trust they will remain so. Rather, my concern is that too many of our current students are being misled into thinking that they're wasting their time if they study anything other than math and science. And that as a result, they're choosing not to take courses in philosophy, history, economics, and literature. Courses that are, in fact, critical to their own futures and to the future of the country in which we live. For their own futures, students will need the capacity to adapt to a rapidly changing economy. They will need to be able to think in multiple ways, to consider problems from a variety of different analytical perspectives, and to be comfortable with the fact that the same problem approached from a variety of different perspectives will likely lead to a variety of different solutions, some of which are incompatible. That's life. They will need to understand, in short, the complexity of the world in which they live. These are qualities that arts and sciences majors have in abundance. The world our students will enter may not be getting flatter, but it's certainly getting smaller. And to function in it, they are going to need the capacity to communicate effectively with a vastly more diverse group of people than ever before. A broad education in the arts and sciences will prepare them well for those challenges. Most of the diverse people with whom our students will interact will be their fellow citizens. And this brings me to my final point. I've talked about the goals of a liberal arts education. An education that encompasses everything from the arts and humanities to the natural and the social sciences. And that puts a mature and complex understanding of human beings at its center. But I leave to last the most important goal of this long established educational tradition, and that's effective citizenship. We call this educational tradition the liberal arts. Because the Latin word, or the, the, the English word liberal, has as its root the Latin word liber, or liber. It means free. The liberal arts are the
body of knowledge and skills that a free people require to govern themselves in a democracy. That is how the Athenians understood it. That is how the Romans understood it. That is how the thinkers of the Italian Renaissance and America's founding men and women understood it. We need, I think, to remember this point and take it seriously. The curricular content of the liberal arts has changed over time. But the goal of the liberal arts has remained the same. And that goal is to educate students for freedom. None of the great theorists of democracy, past or present, believed that a populace ignorant of the liberal arts could preserve its freedom. I see no reason to doubt that judgment. We will all lose something vital to our democracy if the current generation of students chooses to neglect such an education in the mistaken belief that only by so doing can they find and keep a job. I just don't think it's true. So thank you for listening. Stay in a two-foot radius, I'm good, they tell me. So we'll stay here at the podium. Dean Stacy, thank you. As, a, as an arts and science graduate myself, I just have to underscore what he said. I'm a political science major, and I've worked the last 15 years at Microsoft. And uh, I think about Puyallup High School, I took typing classes, and today I work at a tech company. It's just a very different world. And Department of Labor predicts that most of our graduates today will see 10 different jobs by the age of 40. So it's that ability, as he said, to be adaptive, to be flexible, to be nimble which is just so critical today. So appreciate those remarks. Well, let's talk about that, uh, that Husky experience, that total Husky experience. Very honored to have our Assistant Dean for Undergraduate Affairs, Michael Ann Jung, with us today. Michael Ann oversees first year programs, academic advising, academic support programs, and the Husky Leadership Initiative. Her academic professional career has been centered here at the University of Washington, including a PhD in education. Please, a warm hand for my clan job. Good morning. I am, have taken this opportunity to try some new technology, trying to be a uh, lifelong learner here at the UW. So bear with me as we get started with that. So, can you start? I also will try to be loud. If you cannot hear me in the back, just start waving your arms. I see Paul back there. I know that he'll give me the, the highest sign if, he, if we can't hear. Um, I am here to talk a little bit about the Husky experience. And um, as I was driving in, um, I could see that Terry Hall is starting to be torn down. It's going to be another beautiful new residence hall that's similar to the one we're in right now, replacing Terry. And 28 years ago, I moved into Terry Hall as a first year student. Um, and 18 years before that, I was actually born at the University um, Hospital a couple of blocks away. So in a few minutes, you'll be able to say, wow, she's either come a really far away or not very far at all. <laughs> um, but it maybe makes sense for me to be talking about the Husky experience. I will say one more thing, which is I was graduating the year that Mike was um, president of the ASUW, and he is totally right about that Jerry Seinfeld thing, that he got skewered. <laughs> So, um, I, my first question for us today is, what does the Husky experience look like? Sometimes when we talk about Husky, it looks like this, right? Football game, stadium, purple, W's, we make the W now like this, it's new. The Husky experience should look like this, right? This is some of the really key things, the reason that your sons and daughters are coming here, a classroom activity. The S&M and STEM, which I, that's going to be my new favorite phrase. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the Husky experience also is what happens outside the classroom, right? Inside, outside, all over. One thing about the University of Washington, I think it's really, uh, it's the amazing thing about the University of Washington, is there really isn't one Husky experience, right? It's all those pictures I just showed you and many more. Um, not all students are going to have the same experience here. They're going to be studying different things. They're going to be meeting different things. They're meeting different people, um, experiencing different things outside the classroom. And our goal as the faculty and staff here to support them 
is to help them shape that experience and make sense of it. What we really want them to do is think about it. I had this faculty member in graduate school who used to try to sum up every class session with kind of this nice story, and usually it worked, and sometimes it didn't. But afterwards, he would always lean toward the class and say, think about it. To the point where, by the end of the quarter, all of us in unison, when he was leaning in, would say, think about it. <laughs> and it seems kind of silly to say we need to think about things at a university, but sometimes at a big place like this, when experiences are so diverse, if we don't kind of think about things, we're not trying to make really good sense of them. So I'm involved in a group of folks who's actually really trying to think about how we're going to help students do this. Many of those people are in the room today. Some of us have worked with students to kind of come up with a framework for how we're going to help students think about their Husky experience. And what we're working with right now are kind of four main areas. Identity, choices, relationships, and trajectory. Some of you who may have come through parent orientation last summer may have heard us talking a little bit about this. You may have heard Grant Collin, who's here in the room today, talking about this. And these are really underscored by some questions that we hope students are thinking about along the way. And these are not questions that we think students are necessarily asking only when they enter, and they should not be questions that wait until students are exiting, but that this is a process that students might be asking themselves these questions along the way at multiple points during their undergraduate career. Identity. Who am I becoming, and what will I stand for? Choices. To what will I dedicate my time and effort? Relationships. What am I learning from the people I meet? And trajectory. Where am I going? So when we talk about the Husky experience and talk about helping students to think about it, a word that we often use is reflection. And sometimes reflection has a very kind of touchy-feely feeling to it. And we really think it's, it encompasses both cognitive activity as well as kind of emotional and social activity. So I'll often describe to students that reflection really is just thinking, right? Back to that thinking about it. And when you think about something, you can learn it much more deeply, right? And you know, it's not just in one ear and out the other, but you're really trying to figure out how does this make sense? And when you've really learned something and tried to make sense of it, you can then move on to that point of articulating it. And articulation is really the key to figuring out what's next, whether that next thing is, is the job at the end of graduation or whether that next thing is what should I be taking next quarter, or what should my major be, okay? So I want to talk about that articulation a little bit with a student that I'm currently working with. Meet Savannah. Now, I have to tell you, partly because some people in this room know Savannah, this is not Savannah. Um, mainly because Savannah is not graduated yet. Um, but I just love this photo. This woman is so joyous at graduation, I had to use it. So we're just going to put that as a stand-in for Savannah. Uh, Savannah is a junior right now and working with a couple of people um, around campus, at least ones that I know about, working with me on a leadership project um, and working actually with our Office of Undergraduate Scholarships, Fellowships and Awards because she's a Met Campus nominee for um, a large uh, national scholarship. And so in the last couple of months, she has been prompted to start to think about what does her experience look like and how does she make sense of the whole in order to articulate where she's going next, okay? So this is kind of the combination of things that Savannah is about. She's a psych major, she's volunteered with the Dream Project, that does outreach with, with high school students, she works in the admissions office, she does research in the stereotype lab in the psychology department, she's been a fig leader and a UW leaders mentor, a peer facilitator in courses, and has done internships with a mental health organization. How do these things fit together for Savannah? How can she talk about that as a whole? And I've listened to her um, come to the conclusion that what she really cares about is educational equity. She really cares that all students in society have the opportunity for higher education like she has. And that's been informed by some of the things that she's done in the community, and is currently being informed by a bunch of research work she's doing in the Stereotype Lab. And she's been able to kind of articulate, think about, learn, articulate, and move on to what's next for her. When we go around talking about the Husky experience, and one of our next speakers also is one of our leaders on that, Susan, a lot of times people will say, students will say this, and faculty and staff will say, but what is it? What are you doing with the Husky experience? And we are constantly trying to kind of take a step back and say, this is really a framework for lots of stuff that students are doing. So 
just to reiterate, because I use Savannah as an example, what is the stuff of the Husky experience? It's academic stuff, of course, what's happening in the, in the court, in the classroom, whether that's a major or a minor, or courses you're taking just because you're really excited about them. It's experiential learning, right? Learning through experience. That might be internships, that might be undergraduate research, that might be community engagement, that might be study abroad. Could be all of those things. And it's things that are happening in the community, the UW community, right? Being involved in student organizations, being involved in student government, being involved in leadership events, that kind of stuff. So these choices, a lot of times we'll talk with students, right? We know that I like to emphasize to students there's really two kinds of choices. You can be really intentional about what it is you want to do, but sometimes you find yourself in new accidental situations, and those are important too. So I want to just spend a couple of minutes on that. We know that your sons and daughters know how to make quote unquote the right choices, right? You help them do that in order to make them competitive to get into an institution like this. They did well in school in a huge array of subjects. They were involved outside of class. They really hopefully thought about why they wanted to come to a place like this and articulated it in order to get here. Now that they're here, what we really want them to do is make the choices that are right for them. Not the quote unquote right choices, but the choices that are right for them. So just to echo what Dean Stacy said, students are hearing a lot like STEM or computer engineering or accounting, those are the quote unquote right majors. And, what we, and those majors are right for some students, but not necessarily for all students. So we want students to really think about what is the right choices for me? And in that way, as they make their choices, taking courses, doing things outside the classroom, how will they shape their Husky experience? Now, right alongside that, we all know that sometimes you have an accidental uh, experience or interaction that can be really transformative. There's no way you could have thought through that kind of interaction. Um, I was a product of a relatively small um, community when I came to UW as a freshman. I had gone to 12 years of Catholic school, and I will tell you that my most significant learning experience when I was a freshman was my best friend on the 10th floor of Terry Hall, whose family was, had immigrated from Japan, and she was a practicing Buddhist. I was like, whoa, there's really Buddhists in the world? Yeah, like, I mean, I was just like, uh, that was really transformative, right, and totally accidental. So we really want to encourage students to kind of embrace those new experiences and to be curious and take some risks. Maybe it's going out one weekend and doing trail restoration. You've never been hiking before in your life. That sounds fun. I'll go do that. And that evolves into an environmental studies major, right? Those are the kinds of things that we're talking about. So in that case, that isn't necessarily them trying to shape their Husky experience from the beginning, but making sense of it along the way. Okay, here's the important thing. How can you help us? <laughs> and your children. Um, this, we know, we faculty and staff, we interact with students all the time, that we can have a little bit of an influence on students. Um, but we know also that the time students are spending with each other, with their friends, and with their families, that's the really the most important time, those really significant relationships. So you can help us or help your students by doing exactly what we're asking the students to do, which is to be curious about what they're taking, about what they're doing, about how they're making decisions, and to ask them some questions. What did you do last weekend? Who were you meeting? And what are you learning from that person? And most importantly, you can help them start to make some of these connections, or at least prompt them to think about what those connections are. So I couldn't end this without um, using my favorite word, which my colleagues have heard me talk about a million times, which is really integration. I cannot tell you the amount of times in my long career at the UW that I have sat with a senior who has been literally panicked about kind of what is next for him or her, whether it's graduate school or, or a job, and I have had to kind of reflect back to them, but you've done this, and you've done this, and you're amazing at this, and this skill would translate over here, right? And so it's really my kind of personal mission right now to really help students think about how do you integrate? How do you integrate all of it? Which is kind of what we're calling the Husky experience. How do you take what's happening in the classroom, outside the classroom, in a work experience, and put that into a whole to figure out then what's next? Identity, choices, relationship, 
trajectory. Thank you. for jobs in graduate school. She's worked in higher ed for more than 20 years, master's degree in social work. The Career Center had just so many offerings and really want to encourage your student to, to really take full advantage of our great center. So please welcome their director, Susan Terry. Susan. today. It's really fun to see all these parents out here, and I know some of them, and I've watched some of these children grow up, with some of you parents. Um, it was interesting to hear the buzz at all the tables in the last few minutes, and one of the things that struck me is that I hope that you as parents could pick up on the good energy and the enthusiasm of the faculty and staff that were visiting with you at your tables. Talk about career. We have really fabulous careers here at the University of Washington, and here's the main reason, I think, for most of us, and that is that we get to work with your children. We get to support your children in discovering themselves as young adults, in growing in their professional and personal development, and every day when I have the opportunity to work with one of your first-year students, one of your freshmen, or one of your juniors, or one of your seniors, or sophomores, every time that student is sitting in front of me in my office and we're having a conversation, when they walk out that door, I just take a deep breath because it's exhilarating. It's, it's incredible the, the types of young people that we have in our lives and their goals and aspirations. They may not have full clarity at 18 about what they want to do with their lives. Big surprise how many of us did. But they're enthused, they're excited, they want to participate, they want to be part of this institution, they want to make a difference on the planet. They're really extraordinary. So you have done a very good job of parenting them, and we're really grateful to have the opportunity to support your efforts. So I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about this notion of career sophistication, and along the same theme of how do we help our students prepare for life after graduation, and the notion that it takes all of us. It really is a community of folks to make that happen. So, you know, there's a lot of conversation today about return on investment in terms of is college worth it? Well, I don't think I need to convince anyone in this room because we're all committed to that in one way or another. But I do wonder if any of you once in a great while when the tuition bill comes along think, oh, just went up again? Okay. Yeah, it's sort of challenging, I know. We know that, we know it's challenging. But we also know, we are clear, that college is worth it. Based on everything you've been hearing this morning so far, particularly from Dean Stacy and his remarks. But we know because college graduates earn, on average, two-thirds more than peers with no degree. We know this is a fact. Historically, it has been, it continues to be. And they are more likely to be employed. And don't you want your children to be employed? Yes. They are also more engaged in civic life, they're more engaged in global opportunity, and they're more satisfied with their work experience. This is crucial, folks. This is why we feel so strongly about young adults pursuing an academic major of interest, because we think that is fundamental and foundational to a life of interest and passion. We want them to really experience the university academically, and we also want them to experience the university outside of the classroom and learn a lot about themselves that way as well. The other thing I want to mention here that's really, that I think is important is that there is also a great deal of conversation today about, through the media and whatnot, about unemployed and underemployed new college graduates. Well, I am here to tell you that new college graduates have generally been unemployed and underemployed 
for a piece of time. And I am not discounting the Great Recession five years ago. That's a reality, and we all felt that one way or another. But the fact of the matter is that the transition from college into work life is huge for young people. And they don't always find the right fit first job out. It's building blocks of experience. Hopefully they find a good fit and they're open to learning from that experience and then, as Dean Stacy said, 10, 12, 15 different career paths in their lives. Now, I'm not suggesting that they're gonna be moving home right after college and not be able to find work. We're gonna do our best to help them find good work upon graduation. But that is the transition as much as moving from high school to university is a transition. Transition, And I think it's just a matter of being patient with that, that um, it doesn't always go easily. So that's an important thing to keep in mind as you, if any of you have seniors out there. So we know it's a conflict, complex, demanding world. And the fact of the matter is that the finding employment today is much more complex than it was for some of us in years past. And some of you know that now, as you may be yourself, as adults moving into different career opportunities. A little bit easier if you have a track record, a strong resume, a little bit easier if you have a lot of good solid LinkedIn connections and a great network, but nonetheless complex because of the influence of social media, because of the black hole, where did my resume go when I submitted it to that company. Particularly very challenging for young adults trying to figure out how to maneuver this complex work environment. The two questions that we think a lot about, not only in the Career Center, but across this campus, is how can we help our students create meaningful lives and successful careers? And it is the responsibility of the institution at large, not just the Career Center. How can we support their intellectual growth while also helping them find that first job when they graduate? And that's something, as Mike Land pointed out through the Husky experience, that we're very, very vested in is supporting them in those two ways, particularly. And Mike Land talked a lot about this integrated approach. I think I stole that word from you, from you Mike Land. She does use it a lot, so she has influenced me. So the integrated approach is really critical for us today. We are really looking at the various co-curricular opportunities that our students have, and we're trying to figure out strategies, methods, techniques, ways of creating this net of communication with our students so that they, your children, so that they understand how to connect the dots of these experiences because young people, much like many of us, kind of compartmentalize their experiences. You might see this in your children. This is my academic major. This is my leadership experience with this student organization. This is my internship. What we want them to do is connect the dots of those experiences so that they can articulate the strengths and talents and activities that they were involved in to, a, to um, a graduate school application, to a scholarship application, to an internship, to employment. And that's what we're working on diligently, particularly in the last few years. And it's a very exciting time, particularly as a career person. I'm loving it. So there are many efforts across campus on this front. For example, advisors in undergraduate academic affairs, and they are the ones that, the advisors that are primarily working with the undecided majors. So this would be first year and second year students. They are talking to students about how you explore various activities and be, again, as Mike Glenn said, intentional about your choices as well as beginning to do more career advising with these young people. And in fact, the advisors in undergraduate academic affairs work with our career counselors in my office to provide uh, a navigating career options class. So we work together to work with students around choosing a major and exploring a career. What a natural, organic connection. Guess what wasn't so natural three to five years ago? has become much more of a natural conversation in the last few years, and we're really pleased about that. We also have academic advisors in departments, so once your child has made a decision about a major, academic, academic advisors in departments are working with your students 
about, okay, how do those, these majors you've chosen translate to work? They're getting those questions on a daily basis. And so they are very interested in additional training and, and really enhancing their own toolbox of skills in terms of working with, because they weren't trained in career per se. So we're offering workshops to the Career Center and through different uh, parts of campus to departmental advisors to enhance their ability to talk to your students once they get into a department about the connection to career. We have fabulous units around campus and support. Offices like um, OMAD, Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity, Experiential Learning, First Year Programs, all of these units are working with students on making good choices around their academic majors, dealing with the stress and transition of being a student, and the heavy workload that they feel that they have. I always say to them, wait till you get out of college and find out about workload. But you know, they're very involved. Your students are very involved. They're doing a lot of different things. And they get very stressed out at times. We have the counseling center that supports them and provides career counseling too. All these wonderful services that are the underpinnings for our students to be successful and to lead towards life after graduation to be productive. Our faculty are doing tremendous work in the classroom around career-focused themes. We have faculty members that are very intentional about talking to students about this particular project that you're working on in this class. You are learning about teamwork, and you are learning how to function not only in this classroom academically, but when you step outside into the work world, you'll be using some of the same skills you're using in the classroom. Faculty members who are, for example, we have um, an English faculty member, I do believe she's in the room today even, because she has a first year student, Elizabeth Simmons O'Neill, I'm calling you out, <laughs> who works with her students and has them do service learning projects, where they go into a community literacy program and have an experience working in that program in the community, bring that experience back to the classroom, write about it, and learn how to integrate it into a resume to make it meaningful in a resume. Helping students connect the dots makes the connections between academic majors, classwork, and life beyond the university. And there's many more examples of what faculty are doing and how faculty are getting more and more engaged in the whole theme of how do we help our students understand the transferable skills that they have within their majors because that is the absolutely important point, and I'm going to illustrate that to you in just a little while. So what we're trying to do with the Husky experience is we're really working on high impact experiences. We want your students to be involved in undergraduate research, service learning in the community, travel abroad, productive meaningful internships, learning communities. We want them to have these experiences because and this is our mantra nowadays that's really coming directly out of our provost office, which is the UDEP is a major and more critical. We are about the classroom and we are about what students gain outside of the classroom as well. So what are the essential learning outcomes? And some of these things have already been talked about by Dean Stacy, by Michael Ann, but just to reiterate, our students in the classroom as well as outside of the classroom are gaining the skills of teamwork, communication, a cultural understanding, critical thinking. And I think, Dean Stacy, you have, don't you have another name for critical thinking? I call it multiple ways of thinking. Multiple ways of thinking. I heard you talk about that one time, and I love it. Multiple ways of looking at the landscape and figuring out what's going on around you. Information literacy, lifelong learning, civic engagement, and ethics. These are, these are about the development of a productive individual who can step into life, into community, into global citizenship, and make a difference in their life and in the lives of others. And these are the types of high impact outcomes that students benefit from when they engage not only in the classroom but outside of the classroom. The important part of that engagement outside of the classroom is more and more we're talking about the notion of being intentional. For years, we used to say to students, oh, go explore, you have plenty of time. Well, you know what? Students are saying to us, no, we don't. 
Don't tell us we have plenty of time because you're telling me I have to choose a major in my sophomore year. And you're telling me I should have two internships, maybe even three. And you're telling me that employers expect me to be able to articulate my talent. How do I do that? I'm not even sure what my talent is. So they're calling upon us and asking us to be more directed with them and more supportive around not prescribing per se, although I do love that word because I just like to tell people what to do. <laughs> but being intentional and in making solid recommendations to them about what would support their resume and their portfolio and best prepare them for life after university. So the UTEP is a major in more. It is an academic major, and again, we want our students, we want your children to pick a major of interest, maybe even a major of passion. Coupled with co-curricular experiences, and then of course, campus career resources, and I'm not just talking about the Career Center, although you may have picked up this puzzle piece, a little bit of marketing, never hurts. This is where the Career Center is located, here's some of our services, equals, in my world, job search and workforce preparation. Of course, it equals much more than that. But in terms of my world, it equals job search and workforce preparation and job search skills, which are absolutely critical that we prepare your students as they move through the university each year to be very sophisticated in their ability to maneuver through the world of work. So here are some of the core elements that you can see there. It's as basic as writing a tailored resume, which is the presenting question in our office. Students are always coming in with two questions. One is, what do I do with my major in? And we're really working to get that question answered across campus. And the other one is, how do I prepare a good resume? But it's great that they walk in the door with those questions because then we get to ask them additional questions. Like, all right, let's get your resume in shape, and by the way, can we talk about internships? And by the way, what, what are your values and interests and passions? What, what, what do you want to do when you leave university? Because career development is an important component of our work. Building and sustaining a professional net network. Okay, this kind of freaks people out, okay? particularly young people. The, the word networking will send them in the opposite direction of the networking event. That because it's scary. It's scary to approach a stranger and ask questions about their profession. It's, you know, it makes them nervous to think about asking for support or help when you say to someone, if you go out and network, we say to a student, if you go out and network, make sure you ask that individual you're talking to for a referral. They just look at you like you've lost your mind. You mean you want me to talk to a stranger about a referral? Yes, I do, and this is how it works. So we teach them how to do that. They need the tools for that. It sounds very, for most of us, that sounds like something we're quite used to doing, but for young people, it can be pretty frightening. How to conduct an excellent job interview. Understanding the types of careers that exist and how to explore those options. This is what we teach them across campus and in the Career Center. And identifying resources that explain different careers. A critical element here is that students need to be able to translate their degrees and their experiences to an employer and employers expect them to be able to articulate their talent and strength. And, and this takes some coaching and some support. So, um, Dean Stacey, I'm picking on your area. Yes, you can pursue a career path with a history degree. And I just wanted to give you a, a very particular example because, you know, the traditional notion when when a young person is majoring in history and they go home for Thanksgiving weekend and they're talking to their aunt and uncle about their studies, people will say to them, family members, and this still happens today, so are you going to be a teacher with that history degree? And, you know, then they come back in to see their advisor or into the career center and say, oh, is that all I can do with this degree? Well, of course not. There's so much more, as we all know, that they can do with this degree because they're developing these critical skills. And these are the critical skills that employers are seeking. And here's what I want to point out to you. There is so much more. History students, humanities students, arts and science, but thinking about history, humanities, they learn to read, interpret, synthesize complex material. Employers love that. 
Employers are desperate for that talent. They engage intellectual curiosity. They bring motivation, imagination, enthusiasm to whatever project they're doing. Well, most of the time. <laughs> they understand and appreciate cultural diversity. These are just a sampling of the types of skills that students are developing in the academic major. And so what we're working to do with departments and faculty is help advisors and departments and help faculty be able to sort of address some of these skills with students so that then they understand exactly how those dots are connected that I was talking about earlier. Anybody have a history degree in here? All right. Are you employed? Yes. <laughs> See? Evidence. Empirical evidence. Finally, here's just an example for fun of some of the places, and I took this right off LinkedIn. How many of you have LinkedIn accounts? Okay, next time we meet, I want to see those numbers double. We can help you with your profile. And encourage your children, even first-year students, to put together a LinkedIn account. It is something else. I could go on and on. I'm not going to go down that road, but that, that is a fabulous tool for networking. Not the only tool, but a good one. So these, these are just a, an example of some of the areas where we know factual, actual people with history degrees are working. And look at that IT manager at the top. How about that? Because people learn about IT outside of computer science and engineering and other technology specific fields. So anyway, I just wanted to leave you with that thought because I know that you as parents worry about your children. You, you're concerned. You want them to really have a return on investment from this college education. But I also know what you want more for them is for them to have happy, productive lives. And I assure you, we're on the same page with you. That's our goal as well. I thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Doing an amazing job. And, and should your son or daughter move back home with you at age 40, I have Susan's home number. Make a house call with me, so uh, happy to do so. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's say they, they graduate, they have a job. The real question now becomes do they enjoy the job? Is this a job they'll stay with? Is it their passion? Now, how many can stay in that same career? Retention. Honored to have Tom Lee with us today. Tom is the Associate Dean for Academic and Faculty Affairs in the UW's. Foster School of Business. At the Foster School, Thompson is now professor of management specializing in employee commitment, retention, and turnover. He earned his PhD uh, from a school that we don't recognize here at the UW, down in Eugene, <laughs> Oregon. Um, he specializes in neon clothing. Uh, he has received a full pardon because he's been here at the UW since 1983. So, Tom Lee, please welcome. for coming here and thank you for uh, being such a great audience. I'm going to speak less as a professor and more as a parent. My son graduated in 2012 from, um, I'm sorry, 2013 from Evergreen State College. Uh, if you know anything about Evergreen, all the stereotypes are true. <laughs> <laughs> this means my son was kind of challenging. And <laughs> In high school, I don't know if you've had this experience or not, his parents were not cool. <laughs> Absolutely not. And so, one of the most startling, two startling moments. One was while he was junior, senior, he said, Dad, I wanted to go to graduate school. I thought, fabulous. I also thought instantaneously, but I did not mention it. Oh my God, master's degree, four tuition payments. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm now thinking two more tuition payments. That's the state of my life. Well, my son is one of those kids who uh, we've tried to give a lot of opportunities to. And so, because I'm a professor, I had the opportunity to take him around the world. In 2010, uh, while he was in college, I said, Joe, my son, I'm going to go to Paris. You want to go? His comment was, yeah, Paris again? Oh my. Oh my God. What? We spoiled this kid. Well, this 
long lead up is to a critical moment. My son asked me for advice. I don't know if you have, you've had that experience, David, but when my son asked me for advice, I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> this kid thinks I know something. Oh my God. He said, someday I'm going to have a job. <laughs> I like that. How do I know I like it? What do I do? What do I think about? I thought, oh my God, I'm supposed to know something about this topic. And my son is asking, so I thought about this. First I said, well, I've been telling you for many, many years, your whole life, that of course job satisfaction is important. Job satisfaction is important. And he said, okay, fine, well what the heck does that mean? I said, think of it in two ways. One is called, this is the academic term, intrinsic satisfaction and extrinsic satisfaction. Intrinsic satisfaction are those things that you do it because you think it's so cool, it's so fun. You would do it if you, you weren't paid to do it. Extrinsic satisfaction are those things that we all know about. Good pay, good working conditions, uh, the physical environment is good. So I told them, you know, when you think about job satisfaction in your first job, first, you've got to balance the both. And over time, one would be more important than the other. But fundamentally, do you like what you're doing? Do you like what you're doing? And that's just so poor because that leads to things like life satisfaction and happiness. Fundamentally, if you like your job, there's an extremely high relationship to happiness and life satisfaction. And I, I told them also, of course, when you start out, young people, particularly after they graduate, when they get their first job, phenomenal correlation between more dollars, more happiness. <laughs> just incredibly powerful. <laughs> Over time, however, that relationship goes away, and you start thinking about things like satisfaction, engagement, motivation, all those kinds of terms that deal with the idea of you are more of a whole person. My son, who is kind of a wise guy, said, that's good, but how do I know? Oh, I thought, that's a hard question. So I said, well, think about two things. First thing, it is called fit. And fit is something that evolves over time. And my research indicates that it's one of those things that's very visible. You know it. It hits you in the face. You are an accounting kind of person, or you're an art history kind of person. You're a uh, person who likes to go to one place, have a great deal of comfort, and get into this settled routine. You're one of those persons that, my gosh, you want to change everything. Every year, you want to do something else. Every three months, a trip in some exotic place. One of my closest friends. Her and her husband, I don't know how they do it, wonderful people. They've taken a major overseas adventure every single year. They have five children. They've hauled their five children all over the world. And she has the most well-adjusted, nice kids you can imagine. I compare that to my son. <laughs> and after I say, OK, think about fit. The other thing you want, and this is probably the most important determinant of job satisfaction for anybody here, or a young person, or a student perhaps. I actually don't know about students so much, but I don't study students, but I know people who work. I hope my son works soon. <laughs> Mental challenge. Mental challenge. It's that feeling of engagement. Are you pushing the bounds of what you know? Are you pushing yourself? Are you thinking about things you've never thought about? Are you doing things? that force you out of your comfort zone. That simple idea of mental challenge is one of the biggest determinants of job satisfaction. Correspondingly, mental challenge, job satisfaction, then life satisfaction. Very, very powerful thing. Oftentimes, what happens is this idea of extrinsic satisfaction. We get trapped into things because it pays well. We are, have, or will have soon tuition payments. That's very salient. We have insurance payments. We have car payments. We have boat payments. On and on. These are all good things. But after a while, because you get swamped with all these real world good things that are external, but you think you want, you lose sight of that sense of challenge, that sense of intrinsic satisfaction. Uh, I can't tell you how many professors I have worked with who said, damn, I got to retire soon. Well, I'm going to retire, but I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing. I said, why are you retiring? I don't know. I'm just going to, because they hit some sort of magic age. Intrinsic satisfaction is that idea. Would you do it because you want to? 
and you're not going to get paid quite so much. We have a lot of faculty members who, because uh, they don't want to do one part of the job, they cut their appointment, but they use the rest of their job. Just very common. Well, if you think about job satisfaction after you have a job, and you think about fit, and you think about intrinsic satisfaction, down the road, what do you think about? Because my son asked me also, well, after that, what do you do? And I was kind of, you know, look at your little children, and they say, what about, what about, what about? I had this great fear my son was going to be in this, what about, what about, what about? <laughs> so I said, well, the most important thing, the last thing. So I want you to take away this idea of job satisfaction, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and satisfaction. I want you to take away this notion of fit. I want you to take away this notion of, of uh, mental challenge. But the most important thing, the thing that's enduring, as you get older, we use the fancy word trajectories. And that refers to the idea of change. If you are getting more satisfied over time, life is going to be very sweet for you. If, on the other hand, you find yourself, well, gosh, uh, I used to be really, really satisfied, and now I'm just sort of satisfied. You could be headed to really bad things in the long run. Because you suggest, your challenge is going away. You know what you're doing. You know your job. You've lost that sense of, i got to push myself. This is one of these stories do not repeat to anybody else. When I was in a bar once, <laughs> recently, and I sat down to a uh, retired uh, MBA student, and we were sort of chatting. He was uh, a former CEO of one of the smaller companies in the area, you know, 300 people kind of person. And, after his third beer, he was lamenting, you know, I just can't keep doing this. I said, what's that? Oh, coming to the bar and having three beers every day. He said, I like beer, but there's a limit to how much I can drink. And he said, I really need to challenge myself. I really need to push myself. I said, absolutely right. You know what you've got to do. Next task. Uh, oh, sidebar. Uh, fast forward two years. I, actually, I was in the bar two years ago. Two years later, I saw him last week, and he was still drinking his four beers and saying, I really got to challenge myself. <laughs> so, job satisfaction, intrinsic, extrinsic motivations, extrinsic and intrinsic satisfaction, mental challenge, and you got to think about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. The other thing you got to do when your kid asks, and I tell my son this all the time, all plans are imperfect. You got to enact something. You got to start. You got to have action. You cannot have satisfaction unless you start doing something. And even if you don't like what you're doing, you should be smart enough to figure out how to change it so that you can like it. So if I leave you with anything, it is that satisfaction important. Mental challenge is a big, big indicator. Fit is a big, big indicator of how you're doing. How you're changing over time is something you want to think about. And even if you don't do any of that, take action. Because it starts with action. You can't get a job, can't keep your job, you can't like your job without taking action. So, thank you very much. And your kids are going to have a wonderful experience at the University of Washington. I can tell you that the faculty here are so highly committed. All I, I, actually, I'll tell you about the foster school. That's not really going to know about. But <laughs> our faculty are highly committed. There is no limit to what they will do for our students. And equally important to the faculty, I mean this sincerely. I'm a faculty member, and so this is hard for me to say. Equally important, we have a phenomenal staff. The staff work so hard. They are so good with students. Robin here is one of our former staff members, and she is phenomenal. <laughs> we don't get any better than Robin. We were so sorry to see her take a job elsewhere on campus. But it tells you something about the people who work at the University of Washington. They really have the best interest of your kids at heart. Thank you.
clinical education, a PhD in education from USC, a master's in higher ed and student development from the University of Vermont, a BA in psychology from Ohio State University. And I tell dental this, I, I tell them that the rain will only last this month, and I've been telling him that since October, <laughs> since he's come up from LA. We are just so honored. He's just a joy to work with, great for our student body. Dental Sweet. Thank you. Thank you. It's unusual when the introduction is longer than your remarks. So um, I'm going to keep this brief, but I just have a quick question. Did you learn anything today? Yes. Good, good. And, and I think we've accomplished at least one of our goals, which was to help you get a glimpse. And I want you to make no mistake, this is just a glimpse of the numbers of people who are working hard on just one particular issue at this university. We think about this stuff every day. We're committed to ensuring that once your daughters and sons leave this university, they are well prepared for success beyond the classroom. We also had a bit of an ulterior motive. We wanted to make sure that when your daughter or son came home and said, Mom, Dad, there is nobody at UW to help me. <laughs> Don't believe it for a second. There is the 20 plus people who have given up their Saturday morning to be here, they, they are literally the tip of the iceberg. There are thousands of people like us who are committed to helping your son to have a holistic experience at this university. One of the things that I think it signals is that there are strong partnerships throughout this, this great university. The University of Washington is a large place and it can be daunting. However, we try to make it much smaller by ensuring that we work together across different divisions. The academic divisions, the administration, advancement, alumni, you name it. We work together so that students have a seamless experience at this university. And these partnerships are extremely important to us. But there is one other partnership that, that's, that's also important. And that's the partnership with you. You heard throughout the presentation that you have great information about your students, and that information helps us do our job better. I will tell you by way of example, I have reached the ripe old age of <coughs> years old. <laughs> even to this day, all I have to do is pick up the phone and say, hi, mom. She knows whether I've had a good day or a bad day, just from those two words alone. We know that you get that kind of information, and we want to help ensure that, you, that we shape the experience individually for each one of your sons and daughters. I do have a bit of a plea, though. Sometimes my assistant will say, uh, call me and say, uh, Dr. Sweet, there's a, a parent on the phone, and they said they had met you at this event. They would love to chat with you. I'm like, sure, I'll put them through. And the first thing I hear is, what the hell are you doing with my kid? <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. and I want to run to your house and check the basement for pods or something. But realize that there is nothing, there is little you'll be able to tell us that we haven't dealt with before. And we want, we, when you say that again, we want to partner with you in creating a really positive experience. Um, there, if I can give some advice, and, and this, was, this was actually very educational to me. I've only been at the university for a little while. But the information here was, was tremendous. And if I, what, what it said to me is, although my career has been in this field for a long time, there are so many other people throughout the university thinking in, in similar fashions. I actually give some advice to students that I'd like to pass on to you. Then there are only two bits of advice, and I think it ties nicely with what we've been talking about today. The first bit of advice, is, and, and it's all about taking advantage of the, the college experience. The first bit of advice is to please encourage your sons and daughters, if they haven't done so, get to know their faculty members. It really reaps a host of benefits. Many times faculty members will hold office hours and nobody will show. You see the poor faculty members sitting there with a cup of tea holding somebody will show. Doesn't it just break your heart? So encourage your sons and daughters to please just get to know the faculty members. 
they're the individuals that they'll be asking for letters of recommendation for either jobs or for graduate school, and many of your, your children will go to graduate school, I promise you. So that reaps a host of benefit. The second and final tip is, is, is really important, and I, and I want you to hear me when I tell you that the University of Washington educational experience will be incomplete if all your kid does is go to class, go home, and study all that. We know from years of experience and research, and some of this research was done at an insignificant little university in Poland, but the, <laughs> I'm kidding, it's a decent school for what it is. Uh, but, but research done there, here, and other places tells us that students who get involved in the fabric of campus life, who hold opposite positions, who, who attend clubs and organizations, these students have better grades, they graduate at higher rates, they are more satisfied with the college experience, and they are less likely to drop out. And I always ask a simple question to students. If it were you, if you were the person doing the hiring down the road, who would you want? Would you want the individual who never participated in anything in college, or would you want the individual who demonstrated leadership skills and showed that she was able to get along with a diverse group of individuals based on the activities in which she engaged? I think the answer is fairly clear. So the overall message is to really encourage as much as you can, in conjunction with the wonderful people in this room, encourage your sons and daughters to take advantage of all that the university has to offer because it will reap long-term benefit. I thank you very much for your time and attention. We are very happy you're here, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Denzel. Thanks to all of our speakers. Uh, let me just say, if you put it, this is a family. I mean, we're you know family. You're part of that family. You are Husky for life. Husky parents for life. Hope you'll remember that. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a great way to stay involved is to get them a life membership in their alumni association. <laughs> <laughs> the back team. I will say this, I left, you know, some, some of your sons and daughters may leave the region. I was back in Washington, D.C. for 10 years. But I felt connected always to this UW, UW family. It's a great way to stay involved, whether you come back or not. This is a, this is a connection they will have for life, so it's very good. And the last thing, I would just say personal kudos to all of you. I have a two-year-old son. And as uh, in bed last night, as he kicked me in the face at 2, 3, and 4 a.m., I, 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 how did you do it? How did you make it? I, I, it seems worlds away from me right now. I'll be outside taking tips in a bit. Thanks for joining us, but we'll continue this going. Amanda, thanks to you and Student Life. What a great, great exercise today. Thanks for all. Have a great Saturday.